three weeks. Two and a half million flee. Half a continent in turmoil. A politics transformed. And echoes of an old history getting louder with each passing day. At its heart, this crisis is a tale all too familiar to the peoples of Central and Eastern Europe, of great powers treating smaller ones with contempt, of indifference to their frontiers and the lives of those beyond them. That indifference of a powerful man a thousand miles from Medica, crossing into Poland, leads to powerless Ukrainian children shivering in the dark. It is unusually cold, even for the time of year here. Um, you know, you might expect it at night to be minus one, minus two. The forecast to be minus 10 to minus 11 tonight. Everywhere you look in these places, through the cold night air, that imbalance of power has changed lives. I'm a doctor from Kharkiv. Our house was the first one uh, that was uh, injured by uh, uh, Russian bombs. I can't sleep at night. I'm waking up at uh, early morning because I think that now we have to hide somewhere. <laughs> and exhumed enmities which could yet flow down the ages. How do you feel about Russians now? They're killing kids. I hate them because uh, how could uh, people do that, go and attack our children? It's impossible. So you hate Russians? You hate the Russians? Then? Unfortunately, uh, yes. Enmity isn't the only deliverance of war. At a hospital in the city of Lublin, 60 miles from the border, babies have been born in a country not their own, away from fathers that they've never met, that they might never meet. His name is Matfi. He's a boy. He's four days old. Imagine if the NHS had a million and a half new patients all at once. That's what the Polish health system is being asked to manage for who knows how long. I think in a longer period, uh, international, international support, international help will be needed. What would that support look like? Doctors, nurses, uh, supplies? No, I think places, uh, places in the hospital. The ripples of this war flow in all manner of weird ways. This hospital was to be rebuilt, but construction is now halted because half of the labourers were Ukrainian and they've gone home to fight. Yet hospitals aside, this is a country being remade anew. In the fabric of every city, of every town, Jamosh, a few miles from the border, is now part of one huge refugee corridor. So normally this is the gym for a uh, school of electronics in Zamosh, and this is just one of 15 resting points in this city. Just in this city, 65,000 people, 15 resting points. It isn't just the fabric of the cities being remade. Refugees, or at least certain types of refugees, are now welcomed in their millions in this region, having long been shunned. Out of an old reflex has been born a new politics. Zamosh region uh, was very suffered in the Second World War. Uh, my family suffered, a lot of people from this region suffered. For example, my grandmother had to fly to Lviv with my aunt. And my, uh, my grandfather was uh, in a prison camp. That history bleeding 
into that new politics is stretching far beyond these eastern towns. For so long, states like Poland and Hungary have seemed to slip from the wider European bloc, chastised for their move away from liberal democratic values. One of the many unintended consequences of Putin's war is that those wounds, for now at least, seem bound. Uh... To kompletnie zmieni nie tylko wschodnią Europę, ale całą Europę i podejrzewam, że zmieni to cały świat. Nic już nie będzie tako, takie samo jak było, ponieważ wszyscy widzą, że ta polityka współpracy z tyranią, czy to moskiewską, czy jakokolwiek inną, powoduje konflikty i problemy. I my mamy tego świadomość. Dla nas głęboka integracja, ale zachowanie też podstawowych zasad demokracji jest rzeczą w tej chwili nadrzędną. Look at that, the mayor of Warsaw has literally just tweeted that 300,000 refugees have arrived in Warsaw since the war began. So that means that Warsaw's population in two weeks, just over two weeks, has gone up by 17, 18%. Standard. Places like Warsaw and Jamosh and Lublin are this continent's bloodlands. They've exorcised so many of their ghosts, yet other spectres continue to haunt. Imperialism, the politics of grievance, and yet another man to their side who thinks history is at his back. In history, it can feel like there are no new questions, but sometimes there are turning points which yield new ways of answering them. This war asks this region, this continent, whether we've any better answers than those who came before, if this is the beginning or the end of something, if finally Central and Eastern Europe can lay all of its ghosts to rest. Lewis Goodall reporting there. Well, joining me now is Rafał Czeskowski, the mayor of Warsaw. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening, Mayor. Um, you have an extraordinary job to do in Warsaw. 15 to 17 percent of the Warsaw population is now Ukrainian refugees. At the weekend, when the figure was slightly lower, you said that Warsaw was now at capacity. So I wonder what the strains are now and what the challenges are after the weekend. Well, the, the two types of, of strains. First of all, you know, at the beginning, 97 percent of the Ukrainians who were coming into Warsaw were taken care of by their families and by their friends. Now, 30 percent need accommodation, and they're very much traumatized by war because they are fleeing bombs. So, of course, the first problem is accommodation, taking care of them today and now. The second problem is how to prepare our schools our hospitals in order to take care of them long term because of course they're not going to stay in Poland for just a week but unfortunately probably for longer. So we have a situation where you know Warsaw is the main rail artery and a lot of Ukrainians don't want to move beyond Warsaw because they think they're going to be able to get home sooner rather than later. So you've got two jobs in a way you possibly have to disabuse them of that idea that they're going to go home fast but also you've got to persuade them perhaps to move further into Poland, maybe to areas that they don't know. How do you do that and who does that with you? First of all, you know, the, the, the solidarity of the Polish people is absolutely overwhelming. But it has to be said that you, most of the strain is on the local government, on the non-governmental organizations, on, on the people, or on the ordinary people, on the civil society, which accepted Ukrainians to their homes. But much of that is improvised. And we cannot improvise anymore no. because two million Ukrainians, almost two million Ukrainians crossed uh, the Polish-Ukrainian border. If we have two, three, four, five million more, then we are at capacity and we're going to be overwhelmed. So but, we need a relocation system of refugees. And is that relocation within Poland or actually do you want other EU countries and indeed the UK to be the recipients of many, many refugees? Well, I mean, if we are going to have five, seven million refugees, this is uh, the biggest migration crisis in Europe after the Second World War. Remember the Mediterranean crisis in 2015, where we had so many problems? 300,000, 400,000 were coming into Europe every month. 300,000 refugees came to Warsaw in two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's the magnitude of the problem. So we need a system. We need the European Union. We need the UN system to actually be in here and start uh, helping us out 
in a way which is much more synchronized, which is much more structured. For example, you know, all my psychologists now who work in Warsaw are now helping the refugees. Mm -hmm. I can do it for a week, for two, but I cannot keep my children. Yes, I so cannot leave my children without support. And in is there a danger that actually, I'm not saying the atmosphere will turn, but it will become very difficult because, of course, you know, Polish people have been so generous. And that's, of course, their automatic reaction. But if it impacts their lives six months later or a year down the line, what happens then? Well, you know, we are prepared to help. We are going to do everything to help. 4,000 kids are already in our schools. And we are going to do everything for the Ukrainians to feel at home. But if there is no synchronized reaction from the European Union, also from Great Britain, I mean, you know, Boris Johnson promised things, and our red tape takes ages. And he said himself that, you know, he has to rely on the non-government organizations. This is, this is not serious. We need a relocation scheme in the European Union and in the world. I've talked to Justin Trudeau, who was in Warsaw just a few days ago, and Canada is also willing to welcome people. And, you know, the United Nations and the EU have a system which is called a cluster system. It works like, a le like Lego bricks. You know, a different mm -hmm. agenda of the UN is responsible for water and sanitation, different one sets up reception, re re reception centers, different one gives chip cards to refugees mm -hmm. so that they can buy things on their own, a different one brings in teachers and, and interpreters. That's what we need. I'm interested in what you're saying about Boris Johnson because, of course, this new scheme that's been announced for the UK means that people have to apply to have a Ukrainian family either to a char through a charity or indeed individually and then the government steps in. Is that feasible, do you think, for a large number of refugees? Of course not, and we do not have time to waste. I mean, those kids are on our border, and, and they're freezing, and they're traumatized by war, and they're, sometimes they're even lone kids crossing the border. We do not have time for that. And I want, just very briefly, I just wonder if you think, I mean, Lewis Goodall was positing there the idea that it is a kind of reshaping of Europe. That, uh, a further integration of Europe. Do you think that's what's going to happen? But it has to be said, you know, Ukrainians are fighting for our freedom, for the stability of the transatlantic uh, alliance. We have, have our duty, you know. I've received phone calls from Ukrainians uh, fighting who say, you know, you are taking care of our kids and children and we can fight for our own freedom. So we all have a responsibility and we need to do that. We need financing, we need the system in place. And by the way, those finances cannot just go to the central government. They are needed here for the non-governmental organizations and for the local government. Mayor, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.